So we're very fortunate to have Yochi Lu here, and I'm not certain how many people here know the biosensor story, but it's a fascinating story. Um, but it's also, I think, uh, particularly relevant today because Yochi Biosensors uh, pioneered a very interesting strategy in Asia, and particularly China, and we want to spend portion, a portion of this uh, discussion, this interview, talking about China and what it holds for the medtech industry today. So, don't you let me begin? Uh, obviously, we're here to hear the biosensor story, and biosensors is, is you know just shy of thirty uh, was founded just shy of thirty years ago. Before we get to that, you were in the industry for a while prior to that. What were you doing in the industry before biosensors? Well, before biosensors, I was also working for one of the medical device companies uh, uh, with a uh, headquarters in the U.S. And I uh, uh, that company uh, was it was a company called Gould, Gould Incorporated right. in uh, Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I was uh, posted to to Tokyo, Japan, in the early uh, uh, in the late '70s when Japan was going crazy as uh, almost like uh, Japan is number one. And I was very fortunate to be able to witness that sudden growth uh, in the uh, late 70s and the 80s. And then I was able to gain enough uh, uh, experience and uh, network uh, during that period uh, since uh, 77 until 1990 when I founded uh, Biosensors. Uh, I, uh, that was my base. So mm -hmm. I've been in the medical device uh, for almost uh, 40 years. So before we get to Biosensors, at that time, for a U.S.-based medical device company, you were based in Tokyo. Was there much of a market focus or concentration on China or any other Asian markets? In those days, hardly any uh, other than Japan. And Japan was also at an infancy, so I was very fortunate. I was able to witness the sudden you know, uh, takeoff uh, of Japan. And it was unbelievable because uh, I went there with zero sales. And by the time when I finished my first year, uh, with my bonus, I was able to buy a, a put a down payment for a house uh, in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not because of me; it was because of the market being at the right place at the right time. But, but having said that, I think uh, it was very obvious uh, for the first time I found out there was a market outside of U uh, U.S. and it's growing, and that was Japan at that time. And that was that kind of informed biosensor strategy. Just to clarify. Gould was a critical care uh, technology company. Yes, it was. So how, where did the idea for biosensors come from? What led to its creation? And what was its original mandate or, or uh, intention? Uh, the first 10 years uh, after I founded biosensors, we were mostly doing uh, contract manufacturing for medical device companies like uh, GE Medical, uh, 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 Mitsubishi's and uh, Nippon Koden, those were all in the critical cares. So, uh, you know, I, I made decent money, uh, but over the years, you know, being an OEM manufacturer's uh, profit would go down and the demand would, uh, you know, for quality just continue to go up. So to a point where I knew uh, I couldn't just go on with this forever. And then uh, it happened in those days, there was uh, a company uh, that's founded by uh, one of the cardiologists in, at Cedar sinai uh, that wanted uh, somebody to distribute the products for them. They happened to be a, uh, a stent. It's a bare metal stent mm -hmm. and uh, angioplasty. I, f I was able to be the distributor for that company. And to surpri surprisingly, uh, the amount of money I was able to make was much higher than what I could produce. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, six months into that distribution, uh, opportunity, the company was sold to J&J. &J. Uh, so I lost my uh, distribution. Uh, but I, I, I learned you know, how, exp how lucrative it could be. And I took a very, very bold move by uh, telling myself, uh, it's all time that I get out of manufacturing, I get involved into R&D instead. And that was, in a way it was good, but also it was a long, hard road uh, ahead, you know, subsequently, because lots of money and lots of risk to take. So I, where are you distributing the products for that? Where, where were you distributing? Was that, were those Japan. Most, in Japan. Even in those days, only Japan was uh, the, the market that was open. So you mentioned Johnson & Johnson um, <coughs> and the, the sale of the company that you were distributing for. Um, by the late 1990s, biosensors 
you're starting to move into interventional cardiology on its own, as you say, you made more money uh, doing that with your own proprietary products. Uh, and you, you launched an internal R&D effort to develop your own coronary stents. J&J &J was in the market, AVE, Guiden, Boston Scientific. What, to your mind, was uh, Biosensor's you know, uh, role, unique selling proposition? How did you envision establishing a, a kind of special place in the market to compete against those giants? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it was indeed a, a growing market, and J&J &J, uh, by far was the dominant. Uh, and in, in those days, uh, Abbott uh, Vascular was also uh, trying to get into it, and then they couldn't make it. Uh, there was a product called actinomycin. They were trying to uh, launch it as a drug, drug code stent, mm -hmm. and then that did not meet the uh, endpoint uh, in their clinical studies. And then uh, I saw... That was Guiden. Pardon? Wasn't that, that was Guiden? Uh, that, that was Guiden, yeah. Right. And then we saw that as an opportunity. And then coincidentally, at that time, we already had come up with a, uh, a polymer. It's a biodegradable polymer to be uh, 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 coded and uh, delivering the, the drug uh, on the, uh, onto the stent, I mean, on the surface of the stent. And then everybody else was using the durable polymer. And then uh, we uh, took a chance uh, by... Uh, pursuing this uh, biodegradable polymer uh, coated uh, drug stent, uh, we were the first. And you were the first with the biodegradable We were the first one with the biodegradable. And then that was something that uh, uh, in 2003, uh, when we uh, showed our first in men uh, results at TCT, and uh, it was uh, quite a you know, uh, sensation. And that's how uh, Biosensor's name uh, began to be known. Now you had a, a different drug than uh, antimycin, you had biolimus. Where did you get that drug from? And that uh, was a, it was, that was internally, a it was internally uh, uh, developed. Mm -hmm. uh, we first uh, stumbled into a drug, uh, it's called Eberolimus. Sure. Uh, that did not really belong to us. Right. But we didn't know uh, who, who that drug was. And then all, all we knew was that, that we, we had to come up with a drug to coat it with a biodegradable polymer. And then uh, when, when we show the positive results, we found out around the same time, uh, Guiden uh, just signed a deal with uh, Novartis uh, using that particular drug. So uh, that was when uh, we were able to present our first opportunity to Guiden in those days with our results that's uh, published uh, at TCT. And then uh, uh, that started the conversation to allow biosensors to uh, sign a uh, very lucrative uh, license agreement not a li license agreement. So we transfer all of the Everolimus technology and the clinical results uh, to Guiden in exchange for uh, some, uh, some money. So how long did the development of the biosensor stent take and how did you, f how did you finance that? Uh, with the money received from uh, 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 Guiden. But you had developed it prior to that. How well, we, we already knew uh, we had to do something uh, because we, we needed a drug if uh, we gave up uh, Everolimus. And then uh, Novartis told us already uh, they weren't interested in uh, uh, working with us because they already signed an exclusive deal with uh, Guiden. So we knew that. And then uh, we also knew what it would require us to do to come up with another sort of a, a, a family of a Lymus drug. And then uh, we, we already were in the works of doing it. Uh, within uh, two years, uh, we, we, we managed to prove that we could do it, and then uh, that's the drug we call BioLimus. Mm -hmm. And then that was the drug that the BioSensors later on launched it uh, under our own brand. So the, the, li the, the license deal with Guiden was also a financing event. I know Terumo was also part of the financing picture for BioSensors. Was that around the same time? It, was, it happened to be the same year. Okay. After we uh, uh, concluded uh, uh, the, the agreement with uh, Guiden, Tiruma also failed uh, in their own way, uh, uh, tried to do another drug code stand on mm -hmm. their own. And then, uh, so they, they saw our results, they liked the concept, and then they came, and then uh, we also signed a similar uh, uh, contract, uh, this time uh, f exclusive for Japan and non-exclusive uh, for the rest of the world. And what, what did the uh, guidance deal, what did that license entail? Was that... That, that, what rights did they get as part of that deal? No, the, the license to, to 
guidance was a transfer of our uh, clinical trials oh, results I see. So they were and the uh, our, all of our R and D uh, 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 effort uh, in exchange for some upfront money, and then uh, that will allow them to move on, and it will allow us to also carry on with our own internal R and D. So. The nice thing about that particular financing was the fact that I managed to raise sufficient money without diluting any equity, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I was a, a substantial shareholder of Biosensors. In Were those you the only shareholder? No, no, I was, uh, I, I own uh, close to 40% at that time. And what was the, where did the other financing come? Did it come from angels? Did it come from uh, venture capital? Originally? Yeah. Uh, it came from some of the, uh, angels and my own money. Mm -hmm. So you signed a deal in 2003 with Guidant, and within a year, uh, Guidant would become the object, subject of a takeover by Johnson & Johnson, which was soon after uh, became a, a battle between Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson. Did that battle for, for Guidant, which ultimately led to its acquisition by Boston Scientific, did that affect your uh, deal with them at all? Uh, in a way, yes. Uh, we, uh, they were able to transfer uh, all of uh, our know-how uh, to uh, Boston. And uh, in a way, Boston was able to take our biodegradable uh, know-how uh, knowledge and then to, 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 to convert it into their own. And what they are selling today, indeed, is the kind of a biodegradable polymer that we started it. So they're biodegradable? Uh, it, I, mean, I, I, I cannot, uh, you know, get, uh, approve, have a proof 100%, but I have a feeling <laughs> it's something similar. Yeah. Once, you, once it was clear that J&J &J and, and Boston Scientific were going to battle, did you care I was which too, of the two? I was too busy trying to launch our own product. Mm -hmm. So what was going on at Biosensors aside from drug Did you have any other, were you developing any other technologies during that time? No, no, no. We were focusing very much on the, uh, our own uh, drug code extent and the drug that we, you know, prior to us. So we knew uh, it would be very lucrative because we didn't have to pay uh, royalty to uh, any uh, pharma. And then uh, everything was belonged to us. And you were selling your own, pro you we, were selling your own uh, proprietary uh, drug that, 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 that was our intention. Mm -hmm. So in 2005, uh, we decided to uh, take the company public in Singapore. And that's how I got involved into Singapore. And then uh, we managed to raise, uh, I think, uh, close to $100 million. And then that was mostly used for R&D. And some of those uh, uh, was uh, uh, used to, to launch the products uh, uh, in China, uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, and, and prior to that, you know, we managed to get um, almost equivalent amount of the, the, the money from the various uh, partners. Uh, so that was uh, a continuation of all of the R&D uh, and uh, the results of our... our uh, who were who your other partners at that time? Uh, I was partner with uh, Terumo, and then I, I consider, you know, Guidon and my Boston, partner, yeah. although, yeah. yeah. But, no, I mean, Boston uh, wasn't my partner, but uh, Guidon was always right. our partner, yeah. So how did Biosensors fare as a publicly traded company? It was kind of a tough because, uh, uh, you know, um, Singapore market uh, has very little uh, understanding and not, not knowledge base about the medical device, but somehow we, we managed to, uh, to, to prevail and survive. Mm -hmm. So you once told me that during this period, you were making a very conscious effort to hire more professional managers into biosensors. What were the challenges the company was facing and, and, uh, and how are you doing? Well, you know, uh, it was very obvious uh, uh, if we wanted to pursue the same uh, course of uh, action like everybody else, we had to come into to the states to compete uh, up against those big big guys. And uh, uh, we did try uh, by just trying to take our time and to get the FDA approval. Uh, and then after two years, uh, we knew uh, we were not going anywhere just because it took so long and then it would requires so much money mm -hmm. and and we just consciously told ourselves uh, we should try to uh, take our technology which we already have uh, a, a, a clinical uh, evidence and then uh, we would m mostly focus first in Asia uh, especially Japan and China uh, perhaps going direct in Europe where CE would be easier to to, to to get it 
and then by finding uh, partners uh, in Japan and China who uh, will be appreciating our technology, and then we will come up with a win-win uh, scenario. And that's how we did it. Yeah, so Jing, because at the time, I think it was almost a given that for any medical device company to be successful, they had to sell them to the U.S. You tried, it didn't work out, but you built a very successful business focusing on Asian markets. Yes, uh, again, you know, it was uh, a similar story. Uh, in the uh, early uh, 2000, uh, Japan was uh, already uh, reached the level of uh, 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 maturity, and then they became definitely the second largest market uh, uh, next to United States. Yeah. So we were very fortunate that uh, we had a partner to address that. And China, uh, at the same time, just started to take off uh, like crazy. Uh, it was growing uh, beyond anybody's uh, uh, expectation and imagination. And we happened to be there at the right time by launching this uh, product of ours. And then it was uh, uh, th th those days when regulatory in China was still uh, not as stringent as today. So we were able to get the approval and we launched the product. Uh, uh, immediately, uh, we became uh, top three. So I want to I, I pick up on the China story in just a bit, but what time, what, period, what time period are we talking about right now? When did you begin to identify China as an important market in which to sell? Uh, in the year 2000, uh, we already began to see uh, China showing a uh, small uh, sign of uh, growth. And then by 2003, uh, we went in there, uh, we were the earlier ones uh, uh, that uh, went in and got the uh, uh, a partner. And then by 2005, uh, I think maybe four or five, we stopped commercializing it. And overnight, the, 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 the product shot off uh, and the sales took off. That was beyond our expectation. Yeah. In the early days of, of drug looting stents and coronary stents, U.S. companies in Europe very quickly took over the European market so that the European market looked a lot like the U.S. market in terms of competitive landscape. In China and Asia at that time, were you, who was your main competition? Were you most, were the U.S.-based multinationals you know, playing? Interestingly, uh, in China, uh, all the big, big players were all there, but somehow they just could not really figure out how to uh, uh, make a proper entry uh, to convince the local doctors to use it. And then uh, in the meantime, the Chinese government uh, was more eager to promote domestic suppliers. And then we, we were viewed as uh, one of those domestic uh, manufacturers. So uh, in a way, we went there at the right time again. But you were based in Singapore at the time? Or were you oh, no, we already uh, uh, had a partner uh, by the name of Wei Gao okay. uh, uh, in China. And then... Uh, and they own 50%, we own 50% of the joint venture. Uh, so uh, we had a factory there, and then the factory actually was running very efficient, although we sent in our own people to manage uh, the factory then. So uh, I want to get to China just a bit before that. We'll get to mm. music financing, but even before that, <laughs> do you ever think back about what might have happened if you had persevered and gone to the U.S. marketplace, or, or do you look back and say not going to the U.S. market was exactly the right decision? Uh, I think looking back, I, I would say we did the right thing by not going to, to, to be in the U.S. I would have been, uh, I wouldn't be here today <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so you stepped down as the CEO in 2008, but remained as executive chairman. Who came in as the CEO and, and how did your role personally change? Um, well, in a way, uh, you know, the company evolved after IPO. Uh, we, we took in a Chinese uh, partner in 2007 because uh, we uh, decided to own 100% of the Ch China subsidiary. Uh, the way we did it was by paying them uh, you know, several hundred million dollars in cash and that the rest was in, in, this, uh, uh, in our shares. So overnight they became a larger shareholder than me. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they took over the, the, the board uh, and they wanted, uh, you know, somebody uh, from China to do it. And around the same time, um, you know, I was about to reach uh, 60 years old. And then, uh, you know, I thought maybe it's time for me to start it, uh, slowly, you know, relinquish my, my position. So I, we, we had a uh, CEO uh, who 
was running China for us, a very able person, uh, and he demonstrated to the Chinese partner his capability. So he was uh, subsequently you know, elected to be the CEO. Mm -hmm. I became the executive chairman and continued to uh, run the company uh, along you know, with him. So 2013, I know, was a, an important year for uh, biosensors in terms of a, a new financing, and for you personally as well. Tell us about the financing that took place in 2013. Uh, maybe before two, 2013, um, I was uh, approached uh, by another uh, private equity firm in China uh, to sell a good portion of my share uh, in 2010. And after you know, I uh, chose to take a, a little you know, back step, uh, I, I, I decided maybe it's time to, for me to, to cash in uh, on my shares. So uh, I sold a good portion of my shares to this private equity, uh, but still remain as an uh, executive chairman. So that one uh, was in a way, you know, after 30 years of hard work, I was able to be rewarded somehow. But the 2013, uh, was indeed a strategic uh, 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 entry by another private equity who uh, uh, decided to buy the, the shares from the Chinese partner who oh, uh, 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 decided to sell. So uh, we end up having uh, two private equity firms to be the majority shareholders of Biosensors by 2013. Mm -hmm. And you had another financing well, before I get to the 2014, what did the, what did the uh, private equity firms see in Biosensors? What plans did they have them? Or was this just a, uh, an opportunistic you know, uh, financing to capitalize on how successful well, Biosensors we, was? We had lots of uh, 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 cash, and then uh, we were quite profitable uh, uh, because you know, of all the things we did it uh, in Asia, especially in Japan and China. So they, they, they were very attracted to our you know, cash flow. At the same time, they also were hoping uh, one day uh, they could take the whole company to China uh, for listing. Uh, because in, in, uh, in Singapore, the valuation is only so much, and then uh, you don't get a, a, as much uh, uh, attraction. So th that was their goal, try to take advantage of the cash position, and also hopefully uh, to, to take it uh, to, to, to China for listing. But, and just to clarify, or to make clear, this was not a distressed financing. Oh, Biosense no. was doing no. extremely well. Well, you know, I, I, I think uh, looking back, if there's anything I should say is that I, I just wish that I hang in there a little bit more <laughs> 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 instead of just giving up so easily. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 67, and I still think uh, I haven't really changed my habit yet. So I, I try to retire, except <laughs> seven work. months later, I'm busier than before. <laughs> so I look back, you know, I, I wish that I, 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 I did not really sell all my shares or most of my shares in a rush, then it would have been a little bit different. Uh, but, but today, uh, the company's pretty much shifted uh, to the different directions from what I want it to be. But the company is private now. The company is very successful, we're still making money, and uh, uh, yeah, private, we went uh, private in 2017. Right. Uh, and, and today, uh, about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, the private equity firm uh, just made an announcement that uh, Biosensors uh, just merged with uh, another uh, medical device company in China, listed company. Called? Uh, it, it's called Blue Sale. And then uh, that was public announced. Mm -hmm. So today they are the biggest uh, uh, listed company of a medical device companies in China. Blue Sale. That's interesting. It, it, it's, it's, it's called Blue Sale, but right. uh, it, they merged, they acquired Biosensors, so to speak, oh. from the private equity firm. But you told me once, uh, well, when you said that they were, want to take the company in the direction that you didn't see the company going and what, what exactly do you mean by that? I think they were more focusing uh, in growing in China because uh, that's what they saw the most uh, uh, potential and the growth and and everywhere else uh, to them was too competitive and it, they weren't that, that interested. Mm -hmm. You told me once that the private equity firms wanted to be more aggressive 
on a multinational? What, what, what would that have entailed? What is that uh, entail? It, you know, I, I mentioned there were two private equity firms. Uh, one was more interested in uh, global, and the other one was more interested in uh, domestic or China. In the end, China won. <laughs> <laughs> so the, re the reason I ask that is because I think in the medical device industry today, particularly in the U.S., there's a lot of interest in uh, China and its role and influence going forward. I think for the most part, uh, you know, particularly when, when Omar Ishraq came to Medtronic about, I guess, going on several years now, mm -hmm. um, and he identified emerging markets as a critical component, the, the initial impulse is to think about China as a huge market into which we can sell products because of the huge uh, uh, population base and because of the government's uh, promotion of expanding healthcare coverage. But China is also, I think, for some, uh, a lot of people are looking at China as a place that will also be a source of innovation, both investing in, in U.S. companies and, um, uh, and also acquiring companies. I, I wonder, uh, before we get into some specific questions, how you see China has a, how you see China having evolved from when you first got involved to where it stands today? And, and do you see China as more of a local, national uh, uh, play with a huge patient pop, huge uh, population, which in its own right can serve as a huge market? Or do you see Chinese companies having more global ambitions? Well, when I first got involved with China, China was uh, very, very small, even smaller than Japan. In but terms of market size. In terms of market size. And a lot of uh, uh, cardiologists uh, needed more training. Uh, so it was considered to be very, very small and minor. But you know, within a few years, uh, they, they, they took over Japan, and then they took over Europe, and it just grew like crazy. And also these uh, uh, physicians uh, who uh, uh, have the chance to uh, perform many uh, procedures, more so than uh, any uh, doctors, uh, cardiologists in, in, in the States. So they gain experience very fast. So today they are, they are very, very efficient. And then uh, I, I see China being very big potentially, will grow continuously. And in that I think everybody will agree. Mm -hmm. But I also see China uh, still having trouble uh, being innovative, and and th that they rec recognize that? that they recognize that, uh, just because you know uh, innovation has never been their experience. They they th that requires some years of a uh, you know uh, experience to acquire. So today I see them uh, hungry for innovation, hungry for technologies. Uh, try to uh, use that uh, what they don't have, and then to make it up uh, to 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 address. Uh, China first, uh, before they will even think about overseas. Now, I'm talking about medical devices, uh, but other products, uh, you already begin to see China taking over, perhaps, uh, you know, the world, you know. Uh, m many, many people think mobile phone, you know, iPhone is, uh, uh, Apple is the leader, but actually the biggest one is uh, China. It's called mm -hmm. Huawei. And oh, really? then they, 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 they have about 60% of the market share in Latin America. Uh, of course, they have... Uh, they pretty much dominate also uh, in China. Uh, so all those uh, uh, electronics, uh, appliances, uh, China already took over uh, from Japan, uh, from Korea, and it, they, they went uh, abroad. But when it comes to medical device, it's a it's different story. Uh, number one, you know, it has a regulatory uh, process, and you, know, you need to really do a proper safety and efficacy uh, verification. And then those are the things that they are not very good at. And, and that, to me, is an opportunity uh, in terms of uh, what uh, people in, a, uh, in, in the US can provide. Uh, so uh, if you have something unique and innovative, uh, then uh, you know, it's very possible there will be somebody who will be interested in China to partner with you and to Take it there and then to bring products into China. What do you? How would you respond to somebody who um, brings up what has been a worry among U.S. companies about lax IP protection and 
Um, well, let's answer IP protection first, and then mm. uh, the difficulty of setting up a, a distribution, particularly on your own. But, but talk about IP first. Is that still a legitimate worry, do you think? Well, I mean, you know, China is, uh, everybody knows that they copy, they copy products. Just like uh, 50 years ago, Japan would copy U.S. for their electronics, for their cars, and, you know, it's, it's all the evolutionary process. And China today is still trying to take what uh, they can get from the West and then try to uh, replicate it and then make it cheaper and better. Uh, so in a way, uh, it's going to be a part of your concerns. And you just have to address it. Uh, most people will address it by sending their own people, by making sure that uh, you know, they, they, they don't take the critical components uh, uh, to China for, for manufacturing. Uh, there are many ways you can do it to overcome it. Uh, but there's no guarantee. And that you just have to know uh, that's part of the risk you have to take. But having said that, uh, if you are confident you can continue to innovate, then it's okay. So you, Biosensors started its Chinese operation uh, as part of a joint venture with a Ch Chinese company. And, and you often hear that that's really the only viable way of getting into the Chinese market. So joint venture, is that still true or is that? Well, I, I still recall even when we had a 50-50 joint venture relationship, uh, we had our own factory manager, we had our own uh, uh, guys that we sent into China. And everybody, including our partners, they were off limit. We would not allow them to come into the factory. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, th that was true. And then it, it turned out to be the, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in, that also was part of the frustrations that they uh, uh, had, and then in the end they, they decided, you know, uh, they cannot get anything out of us, so <laughs> they sold the share at profit uh, to, to uh, uh, another private equity firm. So but those are the things that you just have to realize, it's, 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 it's life. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're now doing, uh, working with, uh, in, in venture with uh, Vertex, and overseeing the, uh, the you know, investment in, in small uh, technology companies. Um, a lot of people in the U.S., particularly as U.S. venture capital has retrenched, uh, are looking to China as a source of capital. And I, I've got to say out here, there's got to be, you know, uh, half a dozen conferences held each year bringing Chinese investors coming over. One, do you think that the hope that Chinese investors will step in and fill the gap left by U.S. investors is a realistic one. And, and if so, do you have any advice for small companies about the difference between taking capital from a Chinese investor, or maybe even a Singapore investor, and um, uh, a U.S. investor? I, 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 I uh, see many uh, uh, success cases uh, you know, for people in, in the U.S. Uh, to have gone to China and to be able to raise sufficient amount of money and to, to come back with uh, the funding from China. And I can name at least uh, three or four. They, they are all medical device, you know. Uh, so it, it is possible. And then you just have to uh, diligently look for the right uh, partner and then who will appreciate your technology and who will you know, uh, be willing to, to work with you. Now, uh, those investments usually uh, will all be, always be having a, 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 a condition that you must manufacture right. in China, and then they have right to distribute. Uh, that, that way, you know, it's a win-win. So, so it's, it's, in a way, it's a uh, sort of a, a negotiation you need to do. Uh, but if you are willing to take that kind of approach, I have a feeling... Uh, there will be more uh, f funding availability uh, in China uh, than uh, possibly in, in the U.S. today. You hear a lot of, you hear talk that there's a lot of capital in China and uh, that Chinese investors may not be as valuation sensitive as U.S. Is that uh, a wishful thinking? I mean, or? maybe, maybe f two, two, three years ago when they were naive, you know, you can think about it, but they learn very fast. Mm -hmm. They learn very, very fast. <laughs> Today, I think they're tougher than you. <laughs> tougher than American investors, I think, or, or the v VCs. What, they are very smart. Yeah, they are very smart. One flip side to that is the role of Chinese uh, companies, large companies, 
as potential acquirers of Western companies. Uh, we saw Microport acquire the uh, total joint assets of uh, Wright Medical. And I have a, a good friend who's a European VC who's going to China a lot these days. And his view is in the U.S. there really aren't a lot of buyers left. So he's now looking to Chinese companies. When you think about not Chinese investors, but Chinese companies, do you see much appetite on their part for Western companies uh, in an effort to be more global? Uh, generally speaking, it's not in an effort to be global, but it's more in, in the interest of acquiring technologies. To bring into China. To bring into China, yes. Okay. It, it's very, very, uh, 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 they are very eager to do so. And what, is the, what does the landscape look like? I want to get to Druggling Sense in, in particular in just a second. But what does the landscape look like in terms of um, uh, large companies, large medical device companies in China? In the U.S., we've seen you know, phenomenal consolidation with uh, Medtronic buying Covidian and St. Jude being acquired by Abbott and you know, Beck and Dickinson buying Bard and Care Fusion. Uh, are there a lot of large, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know much about the market. I, I, you mean uh, local consolidations? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of l large Chinese multinational companies that could be potential acquirers. I know Mindray, I know Microport. I learned a new company today, Blue Cell. Um, but I don't know very many other big Chinese companies. Oh, yeah, companies. There, there are a lot of uh, big Chinese companies nowadays. They, they come to the States, they acquire companies. Uh, you know, Weigao uh, acquired uh, recently another company. I forgot the name, but it's a, it's a critical care company. Mm -hmm. uh, they paid almost $700 million for it. Uh, I, it'll, it'll come back to my mind. So, so it is aggressive. Uh, indeed, they, they, they are very eager to to acquire uh, assets and the technologies uh, in, in the US. Because for them to buy a Chinese company, the, pay the rev valuation uh, available in China, they might as well just buy a US company uh, because it's cheaper. Right. You know, <laughs> Chinese companies, very expensive. <laughs> Nobody wants to touch it. I mean, that, that, that's the fact because yeah. of the supply and demand. So I want to ask specifically about the drug release dead market because I think it, it uh, illustrates another aspect of the Chinese marketplace. Before we do that, who is JW Medical? JW Medical um, started out as a joint venture between uh, Biosensors and uh, Wei Gao. And uh, uh, we provided them with uh, our uh, drug and the polymer, as well as catheter uh, technology. And then uh, they, they would just provide us with uh, with the finance, and then we form a 50-50 joint venture, so to speak. And uh, we started from nothing, and then they did not, uh, they did not have any uh, uh, position in the uh, 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 inter interventional cardiology. In six months, we became uh, uh, one of the top. Actually, in those days, uh, Microport was already there. We were number two immediately in right. six months. And now JW Medical is one of three uh, but they, Three they were, drug yes, stand companies on the yes. marketplace. There's, there's another company that came along the way. It's by the name of Le Pou. Right. Le Pou uh, is, is now number one. And uh, again, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it, they, they received some fundings from, uh, 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 I, I forgot the name, you know, today I'm, I just don't remember the name, uh, from a, a U.S.-based company. A company or a, an investor? It's an it's a investor. It's a, it's a VC. Okay. So the reason why I asked that question is because I was talking to a very prominent interventional cardiologist mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. As I mentioned, when uh, druggling stents, even coronary stents, first got to Europe, U.S.-based companies very quickly took over the European market uh, so that the market leaders in Europe looked very much like the market leaders in the U.S. And I was asking this interventional cardiologist how long he thought it would take for U.S. companies, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, to do something similar in China. And he said, it's not going to happen. He, it's too late. Yeah. yeah, he's, too he's, late, yeah. I think those top three have 85% of the market. 75, 75, 75 80%. 75, yes. 80% of the marketplace. Why is that? And, and is drug only stents Typical? Is it, is it an outlier? What, what, I mean, because it would suggest to U.S. companies that it perhaps is not in the cards to... Well, I, 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 
I think looking back, uh, my uh, uh, answer to that uh, is that uh, no one uh, among all these uh, big players uh, uh, assumed or expected the China market to grow so fast. Mm -hmm. So they were not interested in addressing China. In the meantime, China took off like crazy because the demand was so high. Mm -hmm. And then only those domestic suppliers whose product and the quality may not be as good as uh, uh, American uh, big guys, uh, at least they were w willing to work with uh, the users. They were willing to uh, foster the market. And, and naturally, uh, you know, they were the one to be accepted it. And then if you do that for four or five years, uh, you know, you, you, you control the market. And also price-wise, uh, domestic uh, drug eluding stand uh, tend to be uh, 15 to 20 percent lower in, in price. Well, it's interesting because you say you that. Don't, you don't have to pay for import duties, whereas for right. the, the, the imported products has to be import duties. Well, it's interesting that you make that point. I, I, I meant to raise it before. Um, oh, as I said, Omar Ishraq was the guy who kind of put emerging market strategies on the map for U.S. med tech companies. But even prior to that, Medtronic had identified China and emerging markets as an important future direction for the company. I remember talking to a senior executive. He said to me, there's no question we can sell our products in China. The question is, can we do it profitably? Can we get the kind of price yeah, we need? That, that you get into uh, a uh, how to sell in China. And then, you know, every, every country has its own uh, culture, has its own way of doing it. And definitely, I think, uh, if you have... Uh, uh, to ask a Chinese cardiologist who they prefer to deal with, they would prefer to deal with decision makers and Chinese who understand themselves. So it, it, it was a, a sort of a, a, a home court advantage in many ways. Not, not, not to say that uh, you know, uh, big guys like Ametronic did not do a good job. It's just it, for you to do something uh, for big guys, you almost have to get uh, approval authorizations from the parent, uh, parent company headquarters, uh, whereas for uh, domestic companies, uh, they make decisions very, very much right mm -hmm. on the spot. So, so. The, the, the thing that led to China as an exploding market is the movement toward what some people call move to the middle of the pyramid, the, you know, with the, with the idea, idea being that there has always been in China a top of the pyramid market of you know, several hundred million people who prefer Western products, can afford to pay premium prices. But the real expansive, explosive opportunity comes when you go d the next year down as the, as the health system begins to expand in that marketplace. And then there is some thought that that's a, that is a large market, but it requires a different kind of uh, device. I, I don't want to say uh, an inferior, uh, people like to use a more appropriate product, but one that has fewer bells and whistles, fewer, uh, f fewer, be fewer benefits, uh, priced lower. Uh, is, is, that, is that a correct reading of the marketplace? Yeah, it's, it's generally true. Uh, even, uh, it, even if it's in the US, you have uh, 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 you know, uh, hospitals with high volume. They, they would demand more. And uh, you, you have to deal with them, and then there are uh, less uh, volume hospitals, and then they, they, they are not that demanding. And uh, over the years, uh, China grew in, in so rapidly, uh, those uh, big high-level centers were remain to be just there, and the rest is just uh, growing, uh, not from them, but from uh, those uh, medium-sized hospitals. So we're right up against uh, our, our time. If anyone has any questions, uh, raise them. Do you want, can, you, can, can you make your way to a microphone just because we're taping this? Uh, my name is Anurag Maral from Biodesign. Uh, Yochi, uh, thanks for those comments. Those were really insightful. I wanted you to compare, uh, since we are at Biodesign talk and we are focused on innovation, I wanted you to compare uh, United States uh, Japan and China, you know, you said Japan became number two very, very quickly uh, in terms of the size of the market. Um, but when you look at the Japan market today and the products that are coming out of that market in terms of innovative solutions, they're not that many. 
China is trying to go up the value chain and bring innovative products from China. Uh, they're doing it partly by buying companies that have innovation, uh, whether they're within China or outside of China. Um, do you think that China will succeed where Japan did not? Because US had the largest market. They also have the most innovative <coughs> ecosystem. They sustained that advantage for a very long time. Um, uh, and the market has continued to grow, maybe not at the same pace as, as, as China, for example. But do you think that China can actually overcome the challenge that Japan uh, you mean succeed in terms of growing the market? Growing the market and also creating an, a strong innovation base. Well, I, I think uh, culturally, Japan and China are, are really, really different. Uh, you know, Japan uh, became number two mainly because uh, their, their unit price was uh, two times more. Uh, and uh, uh, they were all matured. Uh, so, so they were able to really uh, uh, get, get there quite fast. And then with the... Uh, uh, reimbursement, uh, you know, system already in place. Whereas uh, in in China, it took them a little while, but market size-wise is is huge. I mean, you know, even many times bigger than the U.S. And then their willingness, then their hungriness was a little different from from Japan. Culturally speaking, Japanese uh, tends to want to understand and wants to acquire, and then wants to not pay anything and <laughs> learn it uh, by just uh, gradually digesting it uh, and to claim that invent it in their, own, uh, in their own company. Whereas China, they just say, more practical, right? You know, I pay you, you give it to me or I steal you and mm -hmm. shut up and then just let me just do it, I'll do it. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, uh, every company's like that, but in a way, you know, I mean, IP is always a, a uh, uh, weakness uh, uh, for countries like China, but the truth is that you know that's what it is. You mean and owning IP or protecting IP? Protecting IP, and then now they are suffering it because now they have their own IP. They don't want somebody right. else to infringe it. So I mean, it's it's a learning process. So China uh, was hungrier than than Japan. Japan was more of a sort of a, a, a samurai con kind of concept where you know we have to do it right. You know we need to do it in a very quiet way. So it may take us five, 10 years. Like Terumo, uh, we did a total of a uh, 12 years uh, agreement. They paid us royally. But in the end, they had their own product. It's almost a copy of biosensors. But you know, I had my share. And uh, would I go, go after them? I mean, I could, or we could. But that's not really the, the point. The point is, they already pay us. And then we knew it was coming, and uh, it's a matter of uh, you know how you want to do it. But it took them 12 years to do it. Ch Chinese, two years. <laughs> Everything will be gone. <laughs> sure. Thank you for your comments. I'm Zach Wolf. I'm a current fellow. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about uh, you're talking about taking money from Chinese investors. And as a lot of the current fellows are, we're having dreams of raising money in the near future. I wanted to understand more about it from the relationship perspective of what you think the pros, cons, and gains of having those relationships as opposed to relationships maybe in Europe or stateside? <coughs> well, in the end, you know, whether you're in the US or in China, everything is driven by, 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 by relationships and by who you know. Uh, and, and today, uh, many uh, uh, successful uh, VCs from China are represented uh, in this country. And then I'm pretty sure they are all very active in uh, uh, look, looking for uh, for interesting deals, and then although uh, you know everybody in the end is just uh, trying to see how much money they can make, right? They don't want to lose money. So depending on how early you are or how how late you are, uh, they may not target you to be uh, the company. But there are smaller uh, company or uh, funds available uh, set up by uh, company within the company. Let me rephrase that question. Yeah. So you're a small company, you're, you're pitching VCs to, um, to uh, raise capital, and you've got a term sheet fairly equal from a Chinese investor and from a US investor. Yeah. What would your advice be to that small company? They're equal, or you should definitely take US, or you should definitely take Chinese money? Yeah, it's a hard question. I, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, people that I know, they end up taking Chinese money. Uh, m mainly because uh, uh, they, they all wanted to go into China. 
uh, because right. uh, there's a side benefit of it. Yeah, that's, a, that's uh, one And then benefit. For, for the U.S., they only ask you milestone. Yeah. And then if you don't get the milestone, they, give, they don't give you the next one, yeah. next round. So I, 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 don't, I really cannot really uh, say which one uh, is better. All I can say is uh, I see more and more people showing interest in taking the Chinese money. But, but you raise a good point, which is that a lot of people do uh, look to Chinese investors as not only providing capital, but help for getting into the... Definitely. Into the chi into you the you cannot do it by yourself without having a partner. Let me ask you one other question. I was having a conversation. This, this was admittedly, you know, mm -hmm. several years ago. I was having a, a conversation with a Chinese venture capitalist, and I was asking about their interest, actually at the time, in biotech, uh, not, not really that med tech. And, and this person said to me that, you know, given the size of the Chinese market, she could make a fortune uh, producing shopping carts. Why would she ever want to get involved with anything as risky as biotech? Has that attitude changed? In is there an uh, appetite for riskier, higher tech? Definitely, 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 definitely. Because uh, you know, the competition is different. You know, everybody can mm -hmm. create shopping carts, but the product uh, like a medical, uh, which is uh, you know gonna have a longer life, and you you have a much higher barrier of entry, and people learn very quickly. All these Chinese, uh, they are very, very clever. Uh, we talked about J.P. Morgan. Uh, f four or five years ago, uh, you only see a handful of uh, Chinese uh, visiting. And this year, I would say 30, 40% yeah, are exactly. Chinese now. <laughs> they are taking over J.P. Morgan <laughs> conference too. <laughs> I mean, you know, having said that, that means they have the appetite. They are interested in knowing what's going on. Well, the other thing I will say to you is if you... The other place where you see Chinese investors in great numbers is actually Israel. If you go to oh, yeah, ICI yeah. or yeah, Biomed, you, you, go down to the breakfast room, half the room is filled with Chinese Well, it, it's, it's a known fact that uh, you know, uh, Israel has a very, very uh, attractive uh, opportunities and many good technologies, uh, uh, he, medical, medical device-wise. Yeah. You've been great with your time. We're right up against it. Let me ask you one other question. I feel like uh, my question might have been a little... U.S. centric when I talk about Chinese companies wanting to come over to the U.S. There's uh -huh. a huge market in the rest of the world. Biosensors was successful basically by saying we can, we can be successful avoiding the U.S. market. When you think about fast growing markets in Asia like Vietnam, Korea, that a lot of people point to, um, do you think Chinese companies uh, are more directed at non-U.S. markets as, as easier places for them to access greater populations. I mean, we were in India earlier this year, and I, I could imagine that Chinese companies would fit very well with India in terms of becoming major suppliers because there's not that much of a native Indian medtech mm -hmm. industry. But do you see Chinese companies as focusing on the U.S. in their global ambitions or more likely to look somewhere else? In, in the end, when you become sizable and you are able to address market outside of China, you know, like a mine ray, uh, 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 then, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of a return. Mm -hmm. The U.S. definitely is a bigger return than mm -hmm. India. You know, we, we could talk forever about how fast India will grow. Uh, but, the, you know, the net results uh, in the short term, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, still remains to be uh, the target for them as a priority. Now, uh, not to say uh, India is not going to, it's not growing. It's growing very rapidly. So they do have uh, uh, a interest in coming into India, but not in the same way as uh, coming to the U.S., which is ready. Well, it sounds like we should all prepare for a greater role and in influence of China in the U.S. marketplace. Yoshi, let's, th let's thank Yoshi very much for coming and, and sharing his much. thoughts. Biosense is a great story, um, and there's a reception just outside that you're all welcome to attend.